Uh, what's blooming this month? Uh, if you go around from the spillway over towards around the curve towards dawn on the outside, there is a great every year lots of purple or violet wood sorrel. Uh, there's also a yellow variety which may be growing up in your yard. It, it's almost considered a weed, but uh, it's a really great one. Um, we got now. Oh, yeah, it's here. Oh, the clicker. Yes, here we go. There we go. Yeah. So uh, this is a little hard to see, but um, I call this Willie Nelson grass. Blue eyes crying in the rain. It's blue-eyed grass, and this is the first year I've seen it lots of places, and I think that's uh, a lot due. It's along the roadsides because we're not spraying. You know, we've got Namakalola to stop doing that, which when they do, it causes lots of erosion. But this stuff's all over the place, and it is gorgeous, tiny little blue flowers, yellow centers. And I will also say about that, if you um, go out the back gate, if you pay attention before you go through exiting the back gate, there on the left hand side, um, we, we've planted some blue eyed grass there and it seems to be doing pretty well. It has not been eaten down to the ground by the deer. It's not protected in any way. So um, consider maybe for your yard if you're looking for something that's deer resistant and, and you can see some of it there in, in clumps because you can't buy it at a nursery. Oops. Oh, yeah, I didn't know. Last that. one. The, uh, World Horse Balm. I had not seen this at all. But as you go down the S curve, it's down the hill there. And um, the, the bloom is absolutely gorgeous, and I've heard that there may be some up higher, um, at the higher elevations now. So, you know, the bloom cycle is going to follow the elevation. But uh, very dainty, beautiful flower, and then just huge leaves. Um, and um, on your iPhone, and I don't know which iOS version it came out on, but now you can take a picture and there's a little icon down at the bottom of your screen on photographs. It's got a little eye in it. If you tap on that, a line will come up and say, what is this? Or something to that effect. And you can tap on it and it will identify the plant. Now, in this case, I just, uh, when I first tried it, I just tried the picture of the bloom and it came up with something that was not wild horse bomb. But when you get the leaves and everything, it's fairly accurate. It won't always give you a good one, but it's a good way to at least get an idea of what you might be looking at. And um, that's it. Thanks, Wayne. Just for that. Do you want the new trail? Yeah, Canada Island. Which trail? On the long trail up Chestnut Cove? Yes, there's uh, yeah. what, what is it called? It's called Canada White Violet. White Violet. A lot, um, just be careful because there's also a lot of poison ivy up there. Someone asked me to point out what this is. Um, this is called, can y'all read it? It says Pollinator Work Zone. And you may see them around the community. Um, this is a, a sign. I, I've been wanting to uh, work with um, BTCI about places maybe where we don't mow specific areas. And like uh, on a hillside coming in through the back gate um, by the dog park, we've planted some wildflowers and they've committed to not uh, weed eat and mow down that area. And a lot of times these signs will say things like, pardon the weeds, we're feeding the bees. But I don't particularly care for the term weeds. So we, that term is always very sub subjective. So this is um, the terminology I prefer. So we're leaving, trying to find more and more places to leave flowers for our pollinators, for our bees and butterflies um, here in Bent Tree. So hopefully you'll see these signs around. And if you have a suggestion for where we need to put one or where you know would be a good place, um, to uh, establish a pollinator area, let me know because we can talk about that and adding them around the community and seeding with pollinator friendly flowers and such. That sounds like it could be a new film for Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> the pollinator wood zone. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right. Okay, so all right, our next um, uh, 
our main presentation today is Ken Tenandini talking about black bears. So I'm going to turn this over to him. All right, um, let me get this right. You can hear me, right? Yeah, yeah okay, great. Uh, first, let me give you a little math. In, in Georgia, there's 5,100 black bears, according to DNR. In our Piedmont area here, there are uh, about two, two bears per square mile. Thus, you do the math, we have supposedly have 11. And for us, it's just uh, our indication that we live in the wild in a, in a really a beautiful place and we're able to see the black bears. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, the quick overview, I can tell you this, that pictures that you are seeing, and, and that's about 80% of them, uh, of the pictures are actually our black bears. So they either were previous ones or our current ones, it's hard to say but we have a great number of black bears. Now, the, the bear on the left side, you see all the, the uh, you, up north we call them burrs, down here you call them hitchhikers. But uh, they come from uh, comfrey. Comfrey is uh, kind of a weed that we have here, and not a weed. All right, it's a flower, all right. See, on, uh, botany is not my area, right? I'm actually an electrical engineer, so I'm way off base here. But, but anyhow, uh, they are, they attract obviously to the bears and, and that's that indication that that's sometime around August that you see that the most. And they are blooming now, right? So, and the other one on the right is just one of our typical black bears and most of the pictures are actually behind our house. All right, a quick story. This is a, a female black bear, obviously. They can breed around three and a half years of age. Um, the way it works, and I'll let you stare at this for a while, around July, summer, they, they go into heat and, and the, the, the sow and then the boars, which are the males, come around and, 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 and breed the females. Now, a typical range for females is about 10 square miles. For a male, it's about 50 square miles. But, you know, you know how it is with males. If there's only one opportunity once a year, they come running, right? All right, uh, so anyhow. The, the uh, uh, mother nature has designed a two-stage process so for bears to, to have infants. And that, that two-stage process, uh, uh, the gestation period, rather, is a period of about seven months. So when they get mated in the summer, uh, the eggs or uh, blastocysts sort of are quiescent. In other words, they're just there, but they're, nothing is happening with them. They're not growing. So about a five-month period goes by of the seven-month gestation period. And then what the bear is responsible for doing is putting on about 20% or 25% more weight. So it spends the time eating about 20,000 calories per day to put on as much fat as possible so that when it can go uh, and into its den and have the, the little cubs, that it's able to provide uh, the nourishment over that period of time. Now, if, if, if for instance, that uh, for whatever reason that black bear is, is sick or injured or something and can't put on that weight, that bliocyst or that area of cells is reabsorbed by the body and it just better luck next year. That's the way it works. Okay, so for the two month period, all of a sudden uh, the cells uh, develop and and uh, and you get these little little guys that appear. All right, uh, let me go on to the next slide. Uh, I I didn't show you this slide because it doesn't to me it doesn't make a lot of sense. But I put it there because it shows you why you don't see people say, well, why aren't I seeing bears in January? For several reasons. The ones that are having cubs are in their den. The other ones that have last year's cubs with them are actually going in rest period, so they come and go. So you still may see them. And then the males and, and uh, the, the uh, older females are, are just 
resting in a spot and you don't really see them. But remember the size of their home range. So you may, they go in and out of entry. All right, let's go on in there. Okay, here's a typical uh, Doug bear, bear den uh, for arriving January Cubs. Now this one was in ta on Tamarack Drive and, and I went with uh, Adam Hammond of the DNR. He's the bear expert. And we looked at a couple of these spots. Now this was about six feet deep and there was a little chamber on the left side. So the bear was using this. Now what they do, how they den is they normally go look for these uh, where uh, trees have fallen down or other things. You don't, we don't have that many caves, so they're not actually going in caves. But anyhow, it's, this is a typical spot. This one happened to be uh, washed out of the spot because of the, of the amount of rain we had that year and moved on to another spot. Okay, this is a, a typical bear cub. Now this, they, when they're born there, uh, they, they, they have a light thin hair on it. That one, this one's a couple of weeks old, but uh, their, uh, their ears are, are channels are, are closed and their eyes are closed. They have no teeth at that period of time. All right, so they're born at eight. Now, if we do the math on this also, eight, eight, eight to 10 ounces is extremely small for a bear that weighs 300 pounds, right? Compared to a, a typical human female, say 140, that has an eight pound baby, right? Big, big difference. The, the other thing about black bears, as far as mammals go, they are the, the, the worst ones for producing additional members of their bear family. Mainly, if you look at, a, let's say, a wild boar in a two-year period, may have a litter of uh, over, have several litters, but that, that go up to around 30. So bears in two years, in two years, they're going to have two. That's not much, right? Okay, so this is a little guy. Now, this, this is one of our little guys also. And the story on this one was, this, this happens to be a male, and uh, the male, with the group, there was also two little females. And what happened accidentally now, uh, so, someone here, a resident, put some kind of a poison under the porch uh, for, for mice and rats. The, 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 the sow got into that because of the sweet taste of it, and it shut down the organs in the sow, and the sow died. And fortunately, uh, they noticed that there was also uh, females, um, also cubs under the porch, because they heard them making noise, and these tree cubs were found. Now, what they did with them is they, we looked around, Adam, Ham, and I looked, trying to find another sow that would accept these cubs. We just couldn't do it, so they ended up going to LJ, which is a rehabilitation type place, and, and probably did not survive. The problem is once they become habituated to humans, they're just nothing but troubles. So that's these this guy unfortunately didn't survive, I'm sure. So that's the sad story about him. Uh, okay. Black bears follow the sow when they can and grow fast. Now this is a picture again from the backyard. Uh, what, what's interesting about this is when the sow, she's off doing her stuff, trying to eat and stuff, and the cubs are kind of playing dry, around. Now, they get stuck like this guy did. The sow will come down and grab them actually by the head, pull them over wherever the obstacles are, put them down again so they can go on their merry way. But they are cute. Okay. Um, black bears eat the preferred type of vegetation and mass. The, the sow's milk provides most of the requirements for about four months after leaving the birthing den. Now, um, mast is, a, I guess, an old English term, uh, meaning a, bo a botany, meaning uh, fruits, fruits of trees and stuff. So uh, mast that I'm referring to here is uh, solid, hard mast is, is nuts and seeds. Soft mast is fruits and different types of vegetation and insects. So they, they are basically omnivores, so they, they eat whatever they can find. All right, another guy wanted, this has been another backyard picture. All right, now here's the story on this. Plant matter uh, forms a majority of 90% of what the blackberry eat diet is, is actually um, plant matter. Uh, they eat eats nuts, fruits, and so forth, and they're not choosy what to eat. They will look for, if they find dead animals, they will eat them. They will do little small mammals. They can catch them. They will eat them. 
So, uh, and the grubs I'm complaining about here, they, you know, I like building my rock walls. Well, these buggers come along and they like to take the big rocks and turn them over so they can find the insects or the grubs underneath. So I'm ever putting them back when they come after a visit. Okay, the first year for black bear cubs, as they say, is learn and play. And, and Jane and I were fortunate enough last week to have a sow come down the mountain and we filled it all by herself. And then all of a sudden, three little cubs appeared that were about 20 pounds. Now, she would go and, and take these sap, big saplings and twist them over, break them and eat all the vegetation on the top of these little trees. These cubs did nothing but play. Play, 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 and hard play. They run up the mountain, they fight with each other, roll down the mountain, run across, go somewhere else. And it was kind of interesting in, in my wife's analysis of you could tell which one were the, the, the male was. Stupid one, she said. You know, they, they would go, they would go, the, the, one of them would go way up on the top of the tree while the other two would stay more around where, where mom was, right? And then the stupid one would would have a hard time coming down the thing, and then they'd fight again. But it was it was really interesting. So, the, but the first year is also when they're supposed to be learning what what to eat. So when they get close to mom, they can smell on her breath what she's been eating, leaf material, or something else. Now that can be dangerous to us because if 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 she's getting into our food, you know, it's by garbage and stuff. Then we also have a problem because those little cubs realize that's nutrition and I ought to be looking for the garbage. So the other thing you can see when when you look at these pictures here that were, again, backyard pictures for me, is the, the bear on the left side. You look at the size of the ears. That tells you it's a young bear, right? When, when they get older, the head turns around and the ears kind of, now they develop into the right size for a bear. And you'll see that later on. But it's, it's all playtime and learning for the first time. Okay, cubs spend the first 17 months with the sow and then winter waking off in pretty torpor, which is a, a, a short nap. In other words, it's a period of, of, re, of, the, uh, of, of relaxation for the day. Now, that could be one day, it could be three days, whatever it is. Then they go out and they, and they feed again. Again, this is a, a backboard your picture. Now, this is not a good picture, but here's what it tells me. This is a February picture of a family eating hickory nuts while leaving my rock walls alone. But the, the picture was taken through a, a window and a screen by an iPhone 6, so it's not a great picture, but it does, if you look on the left side, that's actually the sow, so you can see the cubs are getting pretty big at that point in time. And, and for uh, it was probably six weeks. Jane and I would see them. They would come down, that family unit would come down from the mount every day at about four o'clock. You could almost set your watch by it. And they would come to the left side or uh, just above us. And there's a lot of hickory trees and, and eat the hickory nuts. So, I mean, it was really, really nice to see them. And you could you could set your watch by how, how firm they were. Okay. All right, now, bear weight. Now, you're going to look at this and go, man, that's a big male. It is not a big male. That is a female. And the reason I know that, we saw that a, about a month earlier, that same bear with cubs. And, and the other thing, too, is on the, on the, the left side, where you can't really see in the picture, there was a, a scar. It had gotten in a fight one time, so it was easy to identify this one. But that, that is one big bear right there. And this is, again, this is our bears. Our bears. <laughs> All right, so they, they grow, they live 20 years and they in the wild and they get real big. Okay. Um, okay, time for the bear wise. You know, there's that, as they say, education is obligation. So the, the, this is a, more of a thing on, on a bear wise program that the DNR put together. And uh, now I'm going to go through that with you quick. Okay. Intentional feeding of both is dangerous to black bears and their families in venture. This is not a picture of us here. This is one I got a stock photo I got offline. But but what I'm saying is, and no one would be that stupid here, really. Uh, because that is really dangerous. It's dangerous for the bears because what happens if, if that bear becomes a nuisance bear and starts breaking into your garage and everything else. Pretty soon the DNR comes in and what they're gonna do is they're gonna take that bear and, and, and euthanize it, they get rid of it. 
because they have found that if they take the bear and let's say, let's send it up to North Georgia, right? Now, all you're doing is giving someone else your problem. But beside that, they, uh, Adam Hammond told me they collared the bear and it came back 70 miles to the same location, right? Now, it didn't take 575 and take a car. So they're, they're, they're coming down. So that, that is the issue with that. So, you know, if, if, if people leave their food around and it becomes an issue, then the bear is not going to survive. Okay. This is, uh, again, this is, if you look at the one on the left, you recognize that is our admin building. So this bear here is, is on his way over to the post office and go, let's see if they put the garbage can back, right? Or, or let's see if someone left some bear scraps there. The picture on the right side is, is of course, bear eating a, a bag of garbage. And these two pictures were given to me by our security staff here. Now, what, what had happened on this one is, is, is typical is somebody had smelly garbage, like Captain Young sitting in the front here. They had smelly garbage, and they threw it in the back of their pickup truck, saying, I will take that tomorrow, right? It stinks too much in the house. Now, the bear smells that from a long distance away, goes, grabs the bear, uh, the bag, and, and eats the garbage. So you've got to be real careful about that kind of stuff. Okay. Now, you need to stop also uh, unintentional feeding. Now, look, I... I know a lot of people here love birds. I love birds. I love birds. I love birds. So they put these bird feeders out. Now, the bear is smart, smells the bird seed, gets up on your porch, rips it, rips the thing apart, and, and, and then attack. So what I'm saying to you is simply this. If you get bird, if your bird feeder gets hit and destroyed, don't put another one up. Because really, in reality, birds don't need, uh, it's nice to see the birds, but they don't need your help during the spring and summer months, right? They do in the winter. Okay, now the, the bear on the, on the right side is the stupid owner that's speaking here. Here's what, we, what happened is, we didn't have bird seed in here, but there was bird seed in there in the previous year. So you had that kind of scum that appears on the bottom. Uh, that bear destroyed that my, my feeder here. Uh, Okay, so it, it destroyed our bird feeder, and it wasn't that there were seeds there. So you really have to be careful about that unintentional feeding. Now, as I say here, these aren't our pictures, but they'll, they'll, they'll always, once they know they can find seeds at your house, you could say, oh, I'll buy another bird, bird feeder. You know, they destroyed that one, and you put it out again. They're coming back because they know where, the, where they can find the food. And the other thing is, if if they uh, if before they went into hibernation and they gained all that weight and then they come out, they will remember that uh, Captain Young here in the front put put the uh, bird seed out and they'll come back and visit again because they can remember that part of it. Okay, so they can find anything here. Okay, now this is a picture of the garage door on the left. It's a picture of our neighbor two houses up. And I kept saying to her, listen, close your garage door because the bears are going to come. You got some food in there. Uh, well, didn't quite do it. One day, I went by there, and lo and behold, this was the sow outside, and two cubs were inside uh, by her car looking out at me. So I went and took a picture and framed it and gave them the picture. Now, they, they, will, they will do that. That's what makes believer out of them. So it can be an issue. Now, as far as wildlife feeding in Bentry goes, and you can read it, it's prohibited wildlife because they proliferate beyond the means of nature to sustain it and prevent wildlife from becoming nuisances and threats. So that, that's the way it works. Now, the fine is if, you, if you're caught intentionally feeding wildlife, like the, the, the stupid girl with the grapes, right? Th th that's a $100 fine and probably up to 500 Now, we had one case when, when I was a wildlife manager here, one case over... Uh, where the villas are of someone thinking, oh, I like these bears, and they were throwing bread and stuff out. That got them 500 bucks. So it, it, it happens. Um, now, the BearWise programs hopefully will solve this, but it's going to take time to bring that around. Okay, here, here they are, which makes kind of sense. Never feed or approach bears, secure food and garbage, remove bird feeders when bears are active. In other words, if they hit your bear, your bear, bird feeder, 
take it down for the season. You're done, right? Uh, don't leave pet food out because they love that stuff that's outside. And clean the store grills. Well, I don't do that, but it, it, if they're hit, if they destroyed your grill, they're coming back, really. So be careful. Uh, and let neighbors know if, if you have that kind of problem. Okay, uh, here's one feeding, but uh, the DNR's position on feeding bear is there's no fine associated by the DNR. They they're fully support the bear wise programs, which makes sense. But but if you if you if they get if they come and they hit your bird feed, they're not DNR is not going to come and find you. That's they don't do that kind of stuff. Okay, the, the areas that that are the fear to have the problem the most, as I say here, are bent tree, big canoe, and helen. Why? because there's these seasonal homes. Now, someone in the audience, I won't give his name, Eldon, had, had, a, had, had, a, had a bear problem where the bear actually went under the, his porch area. And fortunately, he was able to get it out before it had cubs. Now, if it had cubs already, you can't get it out. It's not going to leave. Now, another person on Fairway Drive had had one that got under their porch, and, and unfortunately, or fortunately, it had cubs, right? And, and, it, and they took several pictures that are on, on a YouTube channel, but they were underneath there until they get to about eight, eight to 10 pounds and able to walk out by themselves. Other than that, they're going to stay there, right? So once they come out with mom, then mom's in a hurry to, to find a food supply, first a lot of water to clean out her liver and all that stuff from the winter. Because everything that, that was in that bear den when she was having those cubs, she eats or cleans up. Everything, after birth, everything, it's all gone, right? And uh, so that, that's the way it works. So you, you need to be, we need to be careful about having them under your house and, and get them out before they have cubs. But once they do, the DNR is not even going to touch them. Okay. Okay. Well, the talk, I say talk's almost over, but, uh, you know, just remember the, the bear wise rules, right? And, and, and enjoy the black bears that we have. There's a lot of them. Okay. But as uh, long as they don't become a nuisance, they're, they're great to see. Now, uh, we are lucky enough not by me, to have another program that follows that's really interesting. So uh, I'll just tell you that uh, I'll let someone run the program that's called the Pull-Up Challenge, which doesn't include me. Thank you. And I hope you enjoyed my talk. There's a lot of people who've been here a while and probably know this. Some of the newcomers may not know it. Big tree bears have learned how to open car doors. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. So oh, yeah. if you have the odor or breath mints or anything that smells like food, <coughs> bears gonna check it out unless you lock the book. All right. A, a quick story before I leave. He's right. We had we had one that opened up our car door. Left some burrs on the headliner and and ruined some spice that my wife had picked there. But uh, Adam Hammond told me that over in Big Canoe, someone had like mint or something in the center console, yeah. and, they, and the bear smelled that, opened the door, went in, oh, I want those mints, and did $15,000 worth of damage to that car, ripping that console apart. So he, he said, you've got to be careful about that. All right. That happened to a, a car challenge. up here a few years ago, a convertible. They tore it all to pieces. Ken, what's your elevation? <clears throat> Took most of these. A uh, house? Yeah. About 2,000 above sea level. And that's how far above here would you say? Well, above yeah. this level. Oh, not oh we're 200 feet above here. Not this much. is 1,800 feet right here. Okay. <laughs> All right, take two. <laughs> I'm here to introduce a new program to you today. It's called the Bent Tree Pull-Up Challenge. We want to get 100 people to do 100 pull-ups a day for 100 days. <laughs> A lot of pull-ups, but I don't think I can do a hundred. 
We're not talking about that kind of pull up. We're talking about pulling up stilt grass. <laughs> I might be able to do a hundred push ups if you give me time. Oh, no, no, no. We're not talking about having to be super strong or muscle bound. We're talking about something that everybody can do to get rid of the evil that haunts bent tree. Dun, dun, dun. Stilt grass. <laughs> I want the time. Yeah. <laughs> pull-ups? Yeah. We're not talking about that kind of pull-ups either. <laughs> We're talking. <laughs> We're talking about stilt grass. <laughs> Exactly. We want to get a hundred people to pull up a hundred handfuls of stilt grass a day for a hundred days. That's a million handfuls of stilt grass. I know I've talked about this before, but I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this stilt grass. First of all, this is real live stilt grass. <gasps> Let me educate you folks about how to tell what it is. All right. I want to ask Amy to pass around this basket. It's got some stilt grass in it so you can see it. It's kind of like a flower girl at a wedding. She's going to pass it around and let everybody have a little bit. So you can see for yourself what it looks like. Can you pass that around to these fine folks, Amy? You just say, now y'all keep it all for yourselves. Let the people in the back get some. Go ahead, honey. She cute? <laughs> She's going to let you touch it and feel it and smell it and see what it looks like. All right. Okay, now here's what you're looking for. <laughs> When you're looking for stilt grass out in the wild, it has leaves about two to four, two, two to four inches long, Thank you. and they're pointy at both ends. It has a little silvery kind of line right down the middle. Some people say it's reflective. Reflect, I think that's it, reflective. And the bigger it gets, the bigger that line gets. It's not quite in the center. It has a very, very weak root system. Like, it doesn't eject when you try to pull it up because it doesn't have, it's very shallow roots. So if you try, to, if, you, if you're out there when you do this challenge and you're struggling to pull something up, then that ain't still grass. Because still grass will not fight you back. It comes right up. Especially when it's wet, it's like cutting butter. It just comes right up. <laughs> And it can grow a foot tall, but when it really gets going later in the summer, it can be four feet tall, almost waist high. But what's wrong with it? Darling, what's wrong with it? Well, I reckon it ain't worth a hill of beans. It don't belong here in Georgia, first of all, but we got more of it than Carter got little pills. Let me see. Let me tell you what else is wrong with it now. It grows up higher than all the pretty little plants that ought to be out there. So it takes all the sun and shades them out and then they can't grow. Right? And like I said, its roots ain't worth nothing. So it doesn't help with soil erosion at all. But it makes it where the plants that might help the soil stay in place, they can't grow because there's that steel grass taking up all that room. And heck, the deer don't even eat it. They eat everything. Right? Now, we're going to have a little test here just to see how good y'all are because I don't need a bunch of people that ain't worth more than a screen door on a submarine trying to have fondest stilt grass. So, all right, that's what it looks like. Everybody got it? 
He's got some in the basket that's coming around, our little flower girl. She's coming around. She's so cute. That's what it looks like. But now let me show you. All right, now how about that? Is that still gross? <laughs> no. Oh, they might just get it. How about that one? No. Oh, that's marijuana. Marijuana. <laughs> well, if you find that here, you be sure to let a few folks know. Y'all all sign over Andy. All right, you right, you right though. That's not. That's like maybe nimble will or some other kind of grass. Kind of sometimes. Still grass looks like other things. How about that? Is that still grass? Yeah. <gasps> so good. I'm so proud of y'all. I am so proud of y'all. Okay. Now I think they might get it. I just think they might be good. Now you go ahead and tell them more about this challenge. That's awesome. Okay, we're this is we're going to have a kickoff on June fifth, and it's going to run until September twelfth. Each day you pull up a hundred handfuls of stilt grass and record it on a calendar. Yeah, but I'm not going to be here all the time. Hey, that's cool. The calendar is really for your convenience. You don't have to follow it exactly. It's there just so every time you pull up a hundred handfuls of stilt grass, you check it off. You can work a couple of days ahead, or in fact, if you miss a couple of days, then you can make it up. Word of warning though, don't get too far behind because even though it only takes about five minutes a day to do this, if you get too many days behind, you may get a little discouraged. And you know, most of us can start right away because you probably will find it in your own backyard. Just get in there. That is so easy. I told you it was easy. I'm safe. I'm safe. We're planning to have several pull-up parties. Okay. Okay. Like for example, on uh, the golf course between holes four and five, there was a last year. There was a whole swath of the stilt grass. So what we figured we could do is get some people together. Everybody pulls up a couple hundred handfuls of stilt grass. You can mark off a few days on your calendar and then you can go to the tavern and have a drink or two. I, I think this lady in the front here has a question. Yes, ma'am. I can't pull up stilt grass, but what about people that aren't able to? What can they do to help? We need everybody's help. There's a couple of things you can do. For example, you can work with a friend or a group of you can get together. You can even make it a family project. And if that's the case, then you get a couple of calendars and together you can check off as the group of you pulls up a hundred handfuls. You can do it! <laughs> yes, you can. The, the other thing you can do is be a sponsor. For just $25, okay, you can help uh, contribute to the cost of this program. We want to get bandanas for everybody who completes the, the, the 100 days. <laughs> Aren't they beautiful? You, they come in both green and blue. And you'll also get a certificate of completion. We really want to get young people involved. We want it to do a family kind of project. Because one of the things that's really good about this is, is community service. And it can be used in scouts and other organizations. But probably, more importantly, this is a great thing to put on a college resume. And one of... <laughs> One of the things that colleges, in all honesty, one of the things that colleges look for is instead of kids just starting something in their junior or senior year, they're looking for long-term commitments. So this can go down to like middle school or even elementary school level. And if people have, if kids have shown interest in their community, it's golden. So. Thank you, sweetie. Did everybody get some? All right. We. It came from Asia. Asia. A Asia, Japan to be specific. It came over back in the early part of the century, before we had all the styrofoam peanut things, and they would pack 
to use it for packing and stuff on the big ships that would come into the ports. And they would put teacups and things like that in it. And they would use this as a cushion. Well, I guess some of the seeds got loose. And there you go. That's where it came from. It's a sad story. What do you do with it? That, you know, we have, we're going to be talking more about it. But now, all you've got to do is throw it to the side. You can compost it or just pull it out and throw it down. Because it doesn't have any seeds on it yet. It's just later in the fall when it starts to make seeds. And believe me, we'll be telling you about it. Then you have to put it in a bag and throw it away. Make sure it dies. But right now, it doesn't have any seeds on it. It's an annual grass. <clears throat> yeah, that's why we want to start it right away, like in early June. Because at that time and for the first time, a uh, couple of months it should not have gone to seed and when you pull it up just you won't you'll barely even see it the next day it's true yeah but we just want we want to keep it from making more seeds and making more babies for next year that's what we're trying to do keep it from making seeds for next year well now you know okay Silt grass identification cards over at Tally Dogs. And anybody that wants me to come over to their house and say, like, is this it? We can go out in the yard and we can take a look and see. I'll be glad to help because I love pulling up this stuff. I just hate it. I just hate it. <laughs> so we do have sign up sheets and calendars available today. And we thank everybody in advance for your support. Girls, ladies, y'all are so good. You can depend on me. <laughs> Absolutely. You guys are a hoot. You guys are. Thank you so much, Amy, for your help. All right, we have one more very short presentation for you this morning. Mr. Art Tippett is going to wrap up our meeting this morning. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Andy. All right, there you go, sir. I'm going to leave this here, up here, for anybody that wants to take a look later. By the way, the uh, marijuana plant is behind the second oak tree behind the... <laughs> Fence at Andy's yard by the big rock. Just to so you know. Andy, call me. Yeah. Andy. Okay, under the power line, as you know, we've had a group of people going around and and uh, pulling up or cutting small pine trees, bigger trees as you know that's underneath the power line, so the power line company won't come and spray poison. Uh, we've been doing that for about uh, three, four months now. Uh, it's uh, the the power company spreads uh, sprays the broad uh, spectrum herbicides, and uh, it just kills everything. So uh, the goal was here for the Lake and Wildlife crew was to minimize those new trees that were going to grow up underneath the the power lines, and then that will eventually interfere with it. So. Uh, that's what we're trying to do, but again, when they spray, it kills all, almost all vegetation. So you start getting native plants that were dying, uh, that we were seeing, uh, soil erosion, of course, increased, and uh, it just makes the whole place look ugly. And you know those small pine trees growing on the side of the hills, sooner or later, they're gonna get tall enough to fall over, either onto the street or over the power line. Uh, so uh, about a year or two ago, we uh, talked to AMC uh, and they agreed not to spray if we got in there and started doing what we were doing, pulling up the trees, cutting them down, mostly cutting. Uh, and so here's the example of what happens. When they spray, you get that erosion that starts occurring. Uh, and then if you look here, it's kind of hard to see. Hit a couple of those lights. Might help. Up front. Last one. Yeah. Right. Much better. <laughs> Is that worse? No, you can't see art. Oh, that's good. 
Well, I so I so skinny. I held, but I, I was able to hide behind this. Uh, as you can see on the right, you see those kind of little twigs or branches. Those were trees that they sprayed. And this is not the worst picture. I I'd lost a couple of pictures I had where it's just nothing but brown for you know 10, 15 feet. Just all the plants were dead. And see when when they died, then you start getting that erosion. Uh, occurring and, and then it just gets worse and worse. So we're trying to keep them from spraying so we want to have a goal to minimize any new tree growth around the power lines, underneath the power lines, and even actually across the street as the power line crosses because those pine trees grow up and or other trees grow up and fall over. Okay so we try to remove all the dead trees out there because it just looks bad anyway. So we cut them down as we're walking around. Uh, we have a, a big crew that's doing this uh, and we've done the whole 52 miles of bent tree or almost the entire amount uh, to date and so that's going to make it easier as we go along. Yes sir? As of this last week there's been a drop in bent tree. Yes. I know uh, go ahead. Um, it's a amicable but it says contractor drop. And there's two or three workers that are out there, and they're helping out with this. They're going out, and they're cutting down these on their own now. Can I have to saw one? To make yes. Them. They're helping out, and they also are bringing their tall saw so they get some of the branches, too, because that's not what we're doing. But that's, and they have weed eaters, so it, it's really helping us a lot. Uh, but what we've done now is we can now, what you can do is as you taking a walk or walking the dog or whatever you're doing, Take a little pair of loppers with you, and as you're walking down your street and you see a couple little pine trees starting to grow, just cut them. Or if it's even if it's another type of tree and it's growing underneath the power line, sooner or later it's going to get high enough. Now, what do we do about those trees? Uh, that's too tall. Uh, well, we have to if they're interfering with the power line, then you need to call Tom Fowler or Amicalola and say there's this tree growing up in our power lines, and they'll come out and cut it for free. And if we tell Tom, then he can also call them and remind them they need to come out. You can call me too. Oh, okay. I, call Chris. I get, I get this a lot. The, the trees are on common property, which is to the side, in that tree up the side of the road, but also interfering with power lines. Amicable usually will come out within the week and take care of it. Now, if it's a bent tree tree, meaning it's on the common property, not near a power line, you can call me. And we can try to coordinate the buildings and grounds to see if there's a chance. It, generally, it's got to be leaning, but if it's on top of the property and endangering your property, um, please get a hold of me too and we can try to coordinate that. Yeah, and so we're, we're really trying to get this effort going, and, and, and Chris and Tom are really helping, and we really appreciate that. Thank you, Chris. Okay, now we have. We have the, like I said, we're just about complete and with the, the Amicola going around, that's really helping a lot because the last part we had was uh, the little Hendricks Mountain area. Uh, but there's not as many pine trees up there, so that's good. Okay, we're about 95% to uh, percent complete. Uh, so what we've done is we found 18 or 20 captains. So if you want to volunteer, please volunteer. Uh, for example, we divided up the community and so we're uh, around where Megan lives, she takes care of the golf holes one through nine on the street around it and the streets in between. And then she just doesn't always do it by herself. She'll call me or James or Rick and we'll get together some team and go out and give them a hand, give you all a hand. Uh, so James Smith, for example, he does uh, the, the uh, Tamarack, his, his street and a few of the streets right around there. Uh, Bob Rizzuto and Robert Chambers takes care of their streets and a few streets around them. So, it, and so any help we can get as we're around, or you're like I said, you're out walking, and you just cut a few of those trees. That really helps a lot. Helps a lot. And once we did this main clearing, I'm hoping that that's all we're going to have to do is just basically do that. And then, of course, James and I and a few other people, uh, Ken, Dara, will take off and. And Megan and we'll drive around the neighborhood and we'll say, oh, there's a tree this tall that's growing that people missed and jump out of the car, cut it down, and, and then go on. And that's kind of where we're at now.
Okay, uh, and of course, Jessica and John, I don't know if you've agreed to do that road yet or not, but you're on there. I don't know if you're here today. <laughs> Are you here? No, I guess they wouldn't raise their hand, would they? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, they said they would help, and so I just put them on as team captain, and I wrote them an email. I don't know if it made it through or not, but I'm sure it did. Uh, okay, so you can join a team, or, or you can just maintain your yard and street yourself. Okay, and that, I think that really helps a lot. And then James and I and, and the Lake and Wildlife Group, uh, I know Dara's been doing some seeding and she was talking about, uh, Andy, we can't put your plants out there. But the, uh, the, what we want to do is, uh, James and I, as we're walking, and, and you all can do that too, we're trying to kind of do a little test run, get a bag of wildflower seed, and as you're walking and cutting, throw some of those seeds out especially around the power poles and where you're seeing that really bad erosion occurring. Sir? Yeah, on, when you're throwing wildflower seeds out, make sure they're native to Georgia. Yes. Yes. I Thank can, you. Good point. And, and, and the main goal really with this is to keep it, if we can keep under the power lines maintained, then Amicalola won't come back in a year or three years and say, this isn't working, we need to start spraying again. Mm -hmm. Because they have certain requirements about maintenance under the power line, certain uptime regulations, although I know that's kind of funny in here, but they, that they will feel the need to do it. That's like, seems to be sometimes all they know how to do, or maybe it's just the most efficient from their perspective. So we want to make sure that they don't ever feel the need to come back in and and start spraying again. And so that's why we're trying to put some process around and educate people how, what we can do ourselves to make sure they don't. What's the width you're doing? Um, the power yeah. company sprayed, what, six feet on either side of the power Oh, line. at least, yeah, it's from the six road. feet. And, and they also have, you know, the guide wires going down and, and that, which is sometimes 10, 12 feet away. They'll spray right back there. I, used, I had some pictures of some areas like 10, 15 feet back where they've sprayed and there's dead trees. You can see them when you walk around. We try to cut most of those down, like I said, because uh, they, they're kind of an eyesore to me anyway. Yes? At the back gate um, area, when you come in, um, you come to the stop sign there at the stables, There, right there in front of you is the telephone pole and these trees, depending on how the wind blows, they're on those guide wires, you know, and blowing back and forth, and we reported it, and for a, for a, a, a few days, they were fine, but I don't know what they've done, but when the wind is blowing, it just comes, they just fall right back on the guide wires okay. right there next to the poles. So. Inside the gate? Yeah, it's inside I think it's about that lot where they're going to build on soon. Yeah, I'm just going to say, like, they're looking they at building right there. Uh, 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 be a house okay. all that I hope so, but uh, I'm sure... You can get Chris to look into it. Chris? That house is going to be directly across from the Saddle Club Arena entrance okay. by the Backgate Road. Good. And I think that's where most of those are, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. So that telephone and, pole right there, right in front of it. And, and as I was driving yeah. around Little Hendrix, I saw two or three telephone poles where the trees mm -hmm. were up into the mm -hmm. telephone pole. Yeah. I'm going to go back, take pictures, and send them to Chris. And that's what you can do. Take a picture of it. Note where it's at, the street, and, and roughly what the address is, roughly, mm -hmm. if you know, or the lot number, as you're walking by, and then send that photograph and the comments to, to Chris. Is that? That's fine. Yeah, it's compliance at bent All right, Dave, did you have Did you hear that? Compliance? Compliance at bent you said, Chris? No. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And when you are communicating with Art about what section you want to be responsible for, be very clear because I don't live anywhere on the golf course, yet somehow I am the captain that holds one through nine. That's my fault for not being paid with Art. Take it from me. I don't know exactly where you live. No, I, I You're signed up you for some place. No, no, nowhere near where you are. So. But, this yeah. is, I didn't want to do that section. <laughs> I was wondering, is there a, a known source for Georgia of only wildflower seeds? Oh, good question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bob Point. Yeah, no. look, look at uh, the it's University of Georgia site. There's wildflower stuff there. Oh, US I can provide them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can I can provide some um, links. And send them out in an email, right. and it's also some sources to buy, to buy them. There are some um, 
seed companies that have um, good uh, where you can buy the seeds. Yeah, yeah. We'll see what comes up at the back gate. I planted a bunch. Do you, do you rough up the ground and, and throw them in there? And because if you throw one, the bear's going to eat it. Or the, the seeds? Yeah. No, you do. Watering is pro. Yeah, you need soil con for any seed to germinate. You need soil contact, and you need they need water. So. Um, it, it wouldn't hurt if you have a rake and you're just doing a small section. Just kind of do a quick rake, throw it. That's what James and I have been talking about when we're walking with our loppers. We'll keep a rake in the back of our pickup truck and we pull off the side of the road, then we'll do that. I'm sure you've seen some of us out there <coughs> crawling up the side of a hill trying to trying to cut stuff. So. I put a bunch of wildflower seeds down in my yard last year and was really discouraged because I didn't get a lot, uh, um, but then this year I was out there, and there they are, and I took a pic. So sometimes it just takes a little bit more yeah. patience, some, you know. Some that will take up to five years. Up to five yeah. years to grow. So you know, it's kind of like planting a seed, or planting an idea, sharing some information, and right, and okay. so, having a little faith. Eventually, it's going to do it's good. It's okay to plant right from the road on I wouldn't plant up to the reason I wouldn't plant to the road is because that will get mowed down okay. so you want to come off the road six feet or so and you Just know because basically where the power pole is that's what we're trying to do that little area around the around power, the power pole, pole yeah. and the line going down if it was up to me we wouldn't mow along the roadsides but it's but I'm not queen of the world and I know people don't like to walk and they sometimes people, walkers need to step off the road and people with dogs and I mean we need to have some clearance along the roads so it gets it gets mowed it's a constant discussion about how high to mow and how deep to mow and you know we're trying to influence that toward uh, more like somebody said to me once that Ventry is like a state park and um and and I think that's true and I would you know so we're always pushing in that direction and then there are other people pushing in other directions at times and poor Tom and and the operations teams are sort of caught in the middle so yeah. but but don't play it right to the road because it will get mowed right and so we stay yeah and so we stay up around the power pole in that area and just throw the seeds right there Yes, throw them out once a year. It'll take a while. Yes, the birds will eat some. Yes, some will water wash it off. Clover is great. But There's this great um, stuff called Pasture Booster that you can get from Tractor Supply. And I mean, in places where not, you know, maybe in your yard, but in places where something else might not grow, clover it needs a little sun. That's another challenge, right? So most things need sun, but um, pick some spots. And, it, and this and isn't expensive. And see what, see how it grows. You know, pasture booster. It's 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 white and red clover, and it's got a little um, some kind of a coating that helps the seeds stick and and mature better. We've had good luck with that in our backyard. I have a cl clover fields forever. And, and we do want to make sure that if you are a captain, if you are signing up to do this, that you make sure you have a volunteer shirt and that you wear them when you are doing this, so people don't call security and say they're straight people. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to get shot either. So, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Sure. We, we always call before we uh, do any tree cutting with power tools because people will come after you on that. So a, a tree is leaning like over the trail and it's like this and it's a what we call a wood maker so James and I and, and Glenn and a bunch of other uh, I mean I could mention just about everybody especially at the back of the room uh, we, we'll pull out our chainsaw and we'll cut it and then cut it up and then use the pieces to outline the trail uh, the walking path and so on. and so we're out doing that and we get a we get security coming up the very first time going uh, you had two people call on you. They were walking by and were going, we're cutting down this Widowmaker, but they still called security. And the security came out. So now so we sure learned, we call them saying, hey, we're going to use a power saw out on Tamarack and and uh, Day Ridge. So if someone calls, you let them know it's us Lake and Wildlife people and we're wearing our t-shirts. Okay. All right. Uh, that's our all of our um, content yeah. for this meeting. Thank you all for coming.